My mother tried to commit suicide twice because of domestic violence. It totally wrecked me. And there are so many women that are suffering, so many who are killed. There needs to be an end to the cycle of violence. And it's everybody's responsibility to do something. Because if you don't do something, you're just allowing the injustice to continue. In this episode of Neighbour Friendly, we look at the number one cause of death and disability for women in Victoria aged between 15 to 44. Now, as you may guess, it's not alcohol, drugs or tobacco. It's actually family and intimate partner violence. The only thing you can say about family violence is that it is gender specific, so it is a gendered phenomenon. And the vast, vast majority of survivors or victims are women, and there are lots of statistics worldwide to support that, not just in Australia, and the vast, vast majority of offenders or perpetrators are men. So it's primarily men committing family violence against their female, current or former female partners. When Lula was growing up, she watched her mother suffer at the hands of an abusive partner. She was forced to see her mother go in and out of psychiatric hospital due to severe depression and suicide attempts. I grew up telling myself that I would never go through what my mother went through. No man would do to me what they did to my mother. My mother came out from Greece. She had no money, no family. Social security wasn't an option back then. And she had no choice. She felt she had to stay. But I was different. I had a job, I had a house, I had a car, and yet I still fell into domestic violence. It's a question of, of power and dynamics between the sexes, if you like, and a question of control in terms of decision making, in terms of finance, in terms of children, in terms of recreation and socialising, and I think that means that um, a lot of men think it's okay to be violent or controlling towards their female partners. There are several types of abuse in relationships. Emotional, physical, financial and sexual. Controlling and stalking behaviours can begin as early on as the dating stages of a relationship. Initially he cut me off from my, fam my friends. He would not allow me to have contact with friends. Wasn't allowed to do anything without him. He insisted that he had to be with me and we can only do things if he said we could. He came for dinner one time and he didn't like the meal that I'd cooked and he slapped me across the face. I was dumbfounded. I couldn't believe what, was, what had happened. He apologised and said it would never happen again. Despite her doubts and his violent behaviour, Lula decided to get married. But as is typical in these types of relationships, the abuse continued. Lula says within a week of marriage, he assaulted her again. We were ready to go to church and he decided to wash his car. I told him, wait till we get back from church, but he was insisting on washing the car. We got in and on the way to church, we got into an argument and he grabs me by the throat, almost choked me. I could feel the air just leaving my body and he let go of the grip. We came back, we had an argument, he apologised. He said to me it was my fault. And then I remembered the words I used to tell myself as a child, that I would never allow this to happen to me. It can be incredibly scary and difficult to even consider leaving your abuser. But it's important to recognise that this behaviour is unacceptable. It's vital that you seek out help as soon as possible for your own safety and that of any children or pets involved. My life was governed by fear. I constantly lived in fear. I was powerless to get out because I was afraid of what he might do. I had the wounds in my body to prove that he was violent. And so I suffered in silence. I kept it quiet initially because I thought he might change. I didn't want anyone to know. I thought that I could change him, but I couldn't. 
And then it was difficult for me to leave because I believed his lies. He told me I was worthless. He said I wasn't any good. He said it was all my fault. He often called me names, telling me nobody wanted me, no one ever will. We know that they normalise it, they accept it, they don't want to leave because it might affect the children. Um, there is stigma attached to a separated family. There's also the economic consequences of being um, single parent and single parents have a very high level of poverty and, um, and that's always a problem. And a lot of women too blame themselves and they try to change or adapt their behaviour. You get to a stage where you don't know what the truth is and what's a lie. You don't have a life anymore. You just lose yourself regardless of your status in life. You become a victim. You live a life in hell. In terms of women who are the victims, it affects their self-esteem, their confidence, their ability to socialise, their ability to look for work and obtain work. I think that's a big issue. Research also shows that children exposed to family violence suffer long-term consequences. Their academic and emotional development may be affected. They can struggle with intimacy and friendships and have difficulty finding work. Domestic violence took me on a journey I didn't want, I didn't ask for and I didn't deserve. It just ruined me for many years. And the longer I stayed, the harder it was to get out. My only regret is not getting out at the onset. I shouldn't have given him all the chances that I did. He didn't get better, he got worse. Family violence is a detriment to our society. Its effects on the economy are estimated in the billions. It burdens our hospitals, police and legal systems. Dr Alexander says thousands of intervention orders are processed every year. In terms of access to help, the first step is really to raise people's consciousness that what's happening to them at home is not acceptable and it is violence and a lot of women tend to normalise violence so they blame themselves and they think it's just part of a relationship and part of the family structure. But once something triggers their leaving or their recognition that what, what's happening to them is not normal and it's not acceptable behaviour, um, then they're more likely to access. Um, supports and resources to tell someone to call the police, to go to a doctor, uh, maybe to go to a counsellor, maybe to go to a lawyer. I wanted to get out for a very long time and didn't know how. Not that I couldn't. I had a job. I was working. I was financially set. That wasn't my issue. But I wasn't able to leave because I was scared, so scared. Initially I thought about killing him. But then again, I was afraid that I might be convicted as well and I couldn't risk losing my children, so I abandoned the idea. And I made the decision that if he was going to kill me, then I was better off dead. And that's when I decided to leave. No matter what happened, I was going to get out. And when I did get out, I thought to myself, why didn't I do this ages ago? Why didn't I do it ages ago? The second step is accessing the right help. The thing about family violence is that it's not just a legal problem and it's not just a social problem. You have to adopt what's, what we call an interdisciplinary or holistic approach and you have to look at all aspects of, of a victim and an offender's situation. So they need legal remedies. For example, I'm a, I'm a lawyer. That I do a lot of intervention orders. I go to court and get people injunctions and protective orders. Um, if they need police intervention, then they should go to the police and the police should prosecute and do something if it's a domestic violence crime. Um, if they need counselling, then they need to go to some sort of counsellor, psychologist, social worker to support them. Um, if they need housing, then they should go to a refuge or some sort of housing officer. If they need financial support, they should go to some sort of financial counsellor and Centrelink. The Family Violence Protection Act in Victoria is one of the best in the country. There is a well-resourced network of courts across regional Victoria and Melbourne CBD. This includes two specialised magistrates courts in Heidelberg and Ballarat. A legal remedy available to protect survivors from further abuse is the intervention order. Magistrates courts throughout Victoria deal with intervention orders and there are specialist divisions in Frankston, 
Dandenong, Broadmeadows, Sunshine, Werribee, Moorabbin, and Melbourne CBD. Dr. Alexander explains the intervention order process. In emergencies, you can get one pretty much straight away on an ex parte basis, which means where the other side is not present, on a temporary basis. And the police have certain powers. So currently the police are taking out something, at least, something like 60% of all intervention orders on behalf of victims. So what that means is the victim doesn't have, have, is not as overwhelmed by the process and it's also showing the offender that it's not just a personal, I don't like what you're doing to me and I want protection, it's reinforcing that it's unacceptable that he's committed advance because the police are taking action. The courts are very well resourced to run people through that process. But yes, it is overwhelming. It's all very easy to talk about it clinically as a lawyer and say it's available and you can do it and it's easy and it's free and it's accessible. But when you have to go through the process, um, that's why it's important to tell someone and that's why it's important to get some help and not to think that you're on your own. After Lula realises she has to leave her violent relationship, she courageously takes a stand against her abuser and decides to seek out help. One day we had an argument and he pushes me. I push him back. He spits in my face. I spit back, thinking at any moment he'll go with me. But instead he called the police and he said that I was the one that was abusing him. The police came round and asked me what happened. And I said that I want a divorce, but he threatens to kill me and kill my parents. They asked me, do you want to leave? I said, yes. They said, pack a bag. And they tried for one hour to get me into the woman's refuge. And at the end I said to him in front of the police that this was my house, that if I had to leave I'd disconnect the electricity and the gas and that I'd go and get an order and have him removed from the house. Would he leave? And he promised to leave. I gave him two weeks. At two weeks I came back, changed the locks to the house, moved out all my furniture, rented my house and stayed with my parents for three years. That's how I got out. There are also support services available to perpetrators of family or intimate partner violence, including financial aid, housing support and rehabilitation programs. Well, with offenders accessing services or rehabilitation counselling, that, that's sort of an issue. That's part of the consciousness raising. And again, there are campaigns afoot about men, for men recognising that what they're doing is, um, is inappropriate. We know too that social scientists tell us that men are less uh, forward about, or less candid about um, being violent, and also that they don't um, they don't necessarily recognise what they do as violent. They might see it as part of their macho male kind of breadwinning role. That the family is their domain, and they have to be in charge. And so once you get them over that, there are some very good support services for men, but particularly about counselling. So they go to men's behaviour change programs, um, they look at how it affects their children and their, their ex-partners, so that they get some sort of insight that their behaviour is inappropriate. Family and intimate partner violence is an issue that affects all of us, men, children and women. The police and court systems cannot fight this crime alone. Every one of us has a responsibility to say something, to act. For decades, and probably since the 70s when this first became an issue, we had what we called a conspiracy of silence. And so uh, we've had th three or four national surveys at Commonwealth level about the role of neighbours, friends, relatives in reporting family violence and taking some action. And what we know, even after three or four decades of research, is that friends and relatives and neighbours still don't want to get involved. Speaking from her own experience, Lula encourages people who know a victim of family or intimate partner violence to provide support by being there for them, listen to the person's needs. It's advised you do not approach the violent partner without speaking to the victim first as this can exacerbate the problem. Just for the friends to reassure the woman that she is valued, that she does have support, and that she can make it on her own, that she doesn't need somebody like that in her life. She deserves better, so do the kids. To the younger generation, 
both male and female. A lot of the young males tend to copy the older generation. But that won't help them. It'll only destroy their lives and the lives of the women they're with. And the younger women, you deserve better. You're beautiful girls. You don't need this abuse. We'll take you on a journey that might end up in death. It will certainly be a journey you didn't deserve or you didn't want. You've got the right to be free. You've got the right to be happy. You've got the right to live your lives unafraid. Domestic violence will just totally and completely destroy you. Once you've gone through it, you'll never be the same. Get out quick and count your blessings.